So I want to point out that uh, not only uh, Dave Peters and I were at the original 1974 meeting, but Wayne Johnson and Bill Bazman's also here. So either of those guys can take questions at the end. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. So, uh, so um, yeah, thank you all for coming, and thanks to the folks who helped with this. We're now into our sixth decennial meeting here in this series. A number of you asked how the original 1974 meeting came about. So I asked Dave, who was with the Army at Ames in 1974, to help put this together. We're going to take turns presenting the slides, me, him, and then me ending. Uh, and we'll try to answer the basic questions of how did the first meeting in 74 come about, what was it like, and what was the fallout. The first two meetings at Ames were focused up in the top there on rotorcraft dynamics. Um, Lauren actually did a pretty good job at some of this this morning, so thank you for that paper, Lauren. Uh, <clears throat> the next three conferences expanded more broadly into air mechanics, and so were held near, also were held near Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. So I just kind of like to indulge in a little uh, history here and say, so what was it like in 1974, a half century ago? <clears throat> So, well, it seems like everything was different. Apollo and the moon landings were still recent memories. Silicon Valley was just getting up to speed. Big tech was HP and Lockheed rather than Facebook and Google. Vietnam War was winding down and Nixon was about to resign over Watergate. Hey, the 49ers had never even won a Super Bowl. <laughs> we didn't have desktop computers or the internet or email or smartphones or desktop publishing or my favorite, the Mac. <clears throat> Oh, but we did have Xerox copiers, that was a big deal, the HP calculator, dial telephones, and gas lines. The first OPEC oil embargo hit just before the specialist meeting in 74. And we had key punch machines and IBM cards to run our mainframe computers. <clears throat> Excuse me. The helicopter was actually barely 30 years old. Army rotorcraft were, actually amazingly, not that much different from today. But because of the Vietnam buildup and new technology, changes were on the way. The Black Hawk and Apache programs oops, this is going fast, were <clears throat> starting up, but other aircraft were far in the future. This is what it looked like in VertiFlight in 74, advertisements in the industry. And uh, basically, you can see that UTAS and AAH, which were Black Hawk and, and Apache to come, were, were in in you know, and the focus. So what was the technical landscape like back then? In 74, rotorcraft science was roughly 50 years old. And now, 50 years later, it's twice as old. So we come quite a ways. The go-to textbook was Guess Al Myers, and Wayne's first book was still in the future, although he was already working on it. Thanks to the Cheyenne, the compound helicopter was history, while R&D on hingeless rotors and tilt rotors was getting considerable attention. We didn't have comprehensive analysis, we know them today, like Arcas and Camrad, but global analysis was a big topic of discussion. Rotor fuselage dynamic coupling was an unsolved problem, more or less, and full finite element multi-body dynamics was still in the future. The hodges dowel beam equations were big news in 1974. Army researchers like Jim McCroskey, Frank Cardona, and Fred Schmitz were starting to uncover the fundamental sequence of rotor dynamic stall, transonics, and acoustics. And the CFD revolution was beginning to emerge with great impact. Harvey Lomax at Ames was one of the early leaders. But rotorcraft technology was on the verge of big changes. <clears throat> so within this environment, what started this remarkable series of decennial conferences at Ames? In my view, the key factor was the new Army-NASA R&D collaboration at Ames. When I arrived in 68, the Army lab was barely three years old, and NASA Langley was the focus of rotorcraft research in the U.S. NASA Ames had only, essentially only two helicopter specialists, John McLeod and Jim Biggers. The Army wanted an in-house aeronautical research capability to support its mushrooming interest in helicopter missions. They decided to partner with NASA Ames and leverage its aeronautical and VSTAL experience. They'd already tested the XV-3 by that time. <clears throat> So they set up the Army Aero Research Lab under a unique collaborative arrangement and picked up Paul Yagi from the 40 by 80 to be its director. 
This operation added many more Army and NASA rotocraft researchers and turned out to be very successful, I guess. If you'd like to know more about this amazing story, Irv Statler and I recruited 40 Army and NASA researchers to write memoirs about their experiences. Dave is going to hold up this book. This NASA published this, big help to Bill Warmbrot, as SP 2018-371, Figures of Merit. I have it here, and if you'd like a copy, leave me your mailing address, and NASA will be very happy to send you a free copy. So, all right, how did the first specialist meeting come about in 74? It really are, all started with the AHS Dynamics Committee. Bob Wood on the left at Lockheed was the committee chairman, and I became a member in 71. Professor Kurt Honems are in the middle of Washington University, was an honorary member, and I had the privilege, the true privilege, of getting to know him. Honemser was also Dave's advisor, and he was one of the most remarkable figures in rotocraft with numerous brilliant engineering scientific contributions. He was a principal designer of Flettner's first successful production synchropter in Germany in 1938. His post-war work at McDonnell, Douglas, at McDonnell Aircraft included the pioneering XV-1 compound helicopter. The Dynamics Committee at that time was looking for ways that it could engage with the technical community in, in area of dynamics and was interested in a specialist meeting. I remember discussing this with Kurt and proposed that we hold a workshop or a specialist meeting on rotorcraft dynamics at Ames. Ames was a natural location, but in those, in those days the Army could not be a co-sponsor. Paul Yagi, who was my boss, encouraged us to pursue this initiative. He also had a strong relationship with Hans Mark, the director of Ames. And so NASA, Ames, and the Army, and the AHS joined up as co-sponsors. Hence, the AHS, NASA, Ames, Rotorcraft Specialist Meeting. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dave now. <clears throat> of the first dynamic specialist meeting, Jim Biggers agreed to be the administrative chair. And they still needed, though, an administrative chair. So... I honestly, though Jim Biggers was quite a character. He he drove a Dodge Dart, and he had taken the R and the A and switched them on the emblem on the car, so it said the Dodge Track. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was he was the perfect guy. But who were we going to get for the general chair? For the general chair, uh, Ames was far removed from the center of gravity of the of the rotorcraft universe that east bob wanted some leading figure in the technical community he asked a, little, a lot of people he finally convinced ted carter he was the chief scientist of sikorsky bob told ted the same thing that bill warmbrot had told bob you won't have to do anything <laughs> you can see the main players up there on the screen screen jim biggers noted years later those organizers were brave but inexperienced. But they had lots of help from the American Helicopter Society headquarters and from the Ames community, and they had full support of their management, which was great. Okay. Um, Jim Biggers decided that a great way to get support was to organize a local chapter of the American Helicopter Society. So that idea took shape and the San Francisco Bay Area chapter was born. Everything finally came together, you can see on the slide, of uh, the meeting lo logo and the registration card for the conference and for Ricky's high Hyatt house uh, where a lot of people were housed. The meeting was held in building 200 auditorium at Ames. There were about 200 attendees, including representatives from five foreign countries. Some names you might re recognize, John Davis, Bill Bowsman, Wayne Johnson, Dewey Hodges, Jim McCrosby, Fred Schmidt, Dick Spivey, Frank Caradonna, Troy Gaffey, Dick Bennett, Brett Friedman, and Frank Kerr Harris. There were quite a few memorable moments. I'm obviously to resist putting this stuff about me up there. Um, you see me with my advisor, Kurt Honemser, and he mics me up. That presentation was the first of the meeting, and it was the original of my papers on dynamic input. I've given a lot of papers since then, but that one really set the stage for the next two. 50 years, and including a paper on dynamic input today. We're going to do on Thursday. Now, at this point in the American Helicopter Society, you've got to remember 
authors were notorious for going over, over time. It was, it was a problem, and no one knew what to do about it. So Dave Sharp came up with this silhouette of a helicopter, which said, time's up. They gave it the acronym, the Speaker Time's Up Notification System, or DUNS, for sharp, and it did stuff. So we <laughs> warned everyone at the beginning of the meeting that a yellow light would appear for them when they had five minutes left, a red light would come with one minute left, and then if they went over the allotted time, this helicopter would be hoisted from behind the black curtain to announce their transgression. I was the designated timekeeper. So right after my talk, which, which was on time, I moved to the stopwatch in line. So the first speaker began, I started the clock. With five minutes left, I clicked on the yellow light, but it was pretty clear the speaker was far from done and he didn't care. The red light came on. He was obviously nowhere near conclusion. I gave Dave Sharp the signal. The helicopter <laughs> rose up and the audience broke into wild laughter. Now, the guy didn't know what was happening at first, and then he looked over and saw the helicopter and he stopped. All right, the second speaker came up. As soon as I hit the yellow light, he abruptly went into panic and said, well, we could just skip these slides. And he went right to his conclusions and he finished four minutes early. And I felt kind of bad, but we didn't have any problem after that with <laughs> any speaker. Everybody was in bang, bang, bang as soon as I hit the yellow line. So the technical sessions were pretty lively. Here's John McLeod giving one of his papers. There's an inset photo next to him, if you look at it there of the 1962 test failure of the Lockheed Hingeless rotor. That's a test that John McLeod was in charge of. You can see him there in his wheelchair with Paul Yagi of NASA standing right next to him. And some people have speculated that they were having a conversation at that time. John is saying to Paul, I guess I'll have to grow a beard now so no one will recognize me. <laughs> and Paul is believed that they have quipped back, I probably will have to leave NASA after this. Maybe I should apply for a job at that new Army laboratory I heard about. Well, John did grow a beard, and Paul Yagi did become, to become the head of the new, the new lab. There's also a photo here of Ken Amer during the question and answer period, and the questions and answers were all recorded, all included in the proceedings that you can find in NASA SP-352. Now, one of the scandals of the meeting, was that the newly appointed technical chair, Bob Armiston, who was also a member of the Dynamics Committee, was not actually a member of the American Helicopter. <laughs> and, after a, <laughs> and after a strong fatherly lecture from Ted Carter, Bob finally broke down and he joined AHS just as the preparation for this meeting. <laughs> the dinner at Ricky's Hyatt House was spectacular. Paul Yagi gave the dinner address, what can the dynamic community do for future Army rotorcraft? Turns out there was a lot we could do and a lot that we did do. Uh, Paul really had become Mr. Army. He was the one who phoned me and asked me if I would come out and join the lab. And I said, well, this is during the Vietnam War. I said, I'm sorry, Dr. Yagi, but there's a new rule, only one deferment per person per lifetime. <laughs> I've got a deferment in McDonald Douglas. I can't come. Long, long pause. Dr. Yagi said, Dave, we are the United States Army. <laughs> <laughs> we you a deferment. I didn't ask him the salary. I didn't I, so I didn't ask my wife that I'm coming. <laughs> okay. Here's here's the photo of the head table with Bob Paul and some others. Um, there's another table shown in the photo with some several VIPs. There's Roland Dodd of Winnera, Bartram Kelly of Bell, Renee Van der Harden of KLM, Riker Gunther of Messerschmitt Bloom Bulkow, and Frank Harris of Oliver Hertal. The next slide shows some more notables from the back row Dick Lewis of the Army, Jack Langry of UTRC. Front row has John Shipley of Army Langley, John Ward of NASA Langley, Kip Cheney. And Dave Jenny of Sikorsky, Mike Dockville of McNeil Schwindler, and Ray Carlson of Sikorsky. I served alongside John Shipley on the UTAS Source Selection Board, and he found out I'd never ridden in the helicopter. 
And he said, you cannot be on the source selection board. And he actually had UH 1H flying into the Granite City Army Depot. And he gave me my <laughs> telephone. Bill. One of the uh, other highlights of the meeting was the rotor loads panel you've heard, you've heard, heard about. Um, it, inclu it included a who's who of dynamicists, Bob Ormiston, Troy Gaffey, Frank Tozanin, Dick White, Dick McNeil, Andy Lemnios, Wayne Johnson, Dick Bennett, Bill Anderson, and Peter Arcidiacana. The panel focused on the prediction of rotor loads and control loads and to what degree of consensus there might be among industry leaders as to how accurate those predictions really were. And of course, as you know, the panel members all provided Bob with load computations from their organizations for the hypothetical test case Bob had set, and you heard about that in Lauren's paper earlier, and Bob's going to talk a little bit more about it in just a second. The meeting turned out to be very successful. NASA published the papers in a proceedings that included an addendum with the transcriptions of all the panel discussions and the discussions after all the presentations. <laughs> Dr. Zinner address appeared in VertiFlight as an editorial, and there was a special issue of the Journal of the American Helicopter Society devoted to papers from that meeting. This really put Ames on the rotorcraft map and led to the organization of the other descending meetings that came after that. So at the fifth decennial meeting in 2014, we took some reunion photos. On the left are the chairs of the first five meetings. They include the technical chairs, Bob Armisen from 74, Bill Bowsman from 84, Bill Warmbrot from 94, Tom Mayer from 2004, Yun Su Yo from 2014, and also Susan, Susan Gorton, who was the general chair in 2014. And then to the right, are those of us who attended both the 74 and the 2114 conferences, like Bob Ormiston, Wayne Johnson, Bill Bowden, myself, Bill Friedman, and Dick Bennett. I think most of those in that photo, including me, actually attended all five of them. I'm glad I'm here for my sake. Now Bob's going to come back with a sampling of the loads comparison. Dave, that was, <laughs> that was great. Well, I don't think that story about my membership in the AHS was correct, though. <laughs> uh, I've always been a very loyal supporter of the organization <laughs> and uh, always recruiting other people to join up. <laughs> he's, been, he's been quipping ever since. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Bill. Uh, so Dave has already dis uh, discussed the rotor loads panel discussion. And, and Lauren did too, so actually some of this will be slightly repetitive. But I'd like to show a few results. So you can see that the industry was able to come together to do this. There was no funding. And also appreciate how far the state of the art has come. The idea was to make a hypothetical rotor calculation as simple as possible so there'd be a little ambiguity in the results. Everything would be up to you know, the, the methodology. We didn't have any experimental data, but that was kind of beside the point. Uh, so we chose a basic articulated rotor blade. Dang, I'm getting way behind here. Okay. With uniform properties, quarter cord balance, and a simple 0012 airfoil section. Okay, it was as plain vanilla as you could get. <clears throat> the participants are listed here. Dave's already gone through them, and they basically use their own codes. Um, okay, let's go here. So here are a few of the results. Um, there were quite a few differences between the different codes, but this wasn't actually pretty particularly surprising. The differences in the aerodynamics of the basic 0012 airfoil, though, were a bit of an eye-opener. And uh, you might say this, this contaminated the results, but most of the differences were at the very high angles of attack. Uh, the simple articulated blade frequencies, though, even for the first flat bending mode, showed differences which were kind of disturbing. The first torsion mode was even, even more problematic. Okay. And then the blade tip torsion response, because here people are having trouble calculating torsion response of blades, in forward flight was pretty much all over the map. Um, there's a lot behind these curves. I won't go into them, and uh, uh, Bill Basm's commented on them as well uh, later on. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> these results reinforce suspicions about prediction deficiencies. They also influenced the Army comprehensive analysis debate, what I would call global analyses, and helped lead to 2G Charlie, the predecessor of RCAS. 
And they also highlighted the need for experimental data and gave support for the NASA Army Airloads Flight Test Program in the 80s and 90s. Now, again, as Laura mentioned, I revisited this calculation 40 years later in, in, in uh, 2014. And I, I, I was able to f manage to find a few volunteers from Maryland, Georgia Tech, and the Army. Uh, and let's see. By now, you can see that the structural dynamics, the fan plot on the left, was pretty much well in hand for the simple articulated blade. All the three codes, RKS, UMark, and Dymor, fell into place for the first 10 modes, uh, again, as, as uh, Lauren showed. The pitching moment air loads at mu of 0.33 were considerably more consistent than the, the earlier results, and, and compared the 2014 results with Wayne's 1974 result on the left. And it actually showed that he was pretty much on the right track back then. Now, you'll see a lot of differences here, and I won't go into the details. One thing I do have to say is we didn't get enough time between the folks and the codes to really pin down the differences. Whenever you do a correlation, you've oftentimes got to run the code several times to make sure you've got the input data right, you're matching what the other people did, and so forth. But, uh, <clears throat> Of course, we also now have a number of other comparisons between codes that came, came about through the Airloads workshop. So it doesn't have to be a hypothetical ruler. Okay. So I kind of like to wrap up with a couple of points. One of the highlights of the decennial conferences was being able to witness the evolution of aeromechanics prediction methodology that enabled a revolution in rotorcraft research and design capability. And I'm talking about the ability to use CFD today for blades that are moving all over the place in response to those air loads. The key events along this path included, of course, the comprehensive analysis codes that got started up and are in common use today, the initial CFD development in general, and of course that was before, you know, not aimed at rotocraft, but then, then came about the attempt to couple CFD and CSD together. And that started in 85, and Wayne was one of the principals in that activity. The NASA Army UH-60 airloads flight test, which Bill had a big hand in, in doing with the NASA folks, uh, gave us an unprecedented volume of accurate data. The airloads workshop also started up a, a little after that time and leveraged the UH-60 data. And this was kind of aimed at, can we really solve this prediction problem? And we hadn't really solved the CFC CSD coupling problem at that time. Well, because of the collaboration of that, that unique sort of enterprise, the people uh, very quickly came up with a solution to CFD C CSD coupling. Mark Potsdam and Yunsu Yo, and uh, Wayne was in there too again. Um, this then stimulated the TOD Create AV Rotocraft project that gave us today's Helios, which you've heard about. I'm just going to show a few specifics on the next slide here of some of these events. There's the UH-60 airload, uh, NASA Army airloads flight test. There's also the flight envelope showing the amazing number of test points and the maneuver pull-up that went way over the stall boundary. Some of the people at the beginning and at the end and the final meeting of the airloads workshop the first loose coupling calculation of Potsdam and company showing pitching moment versus azimuth for the UH-60 air loads. And the green curve in there was CAMRAD, and you can see it just did not get that peak negative pitching moment at the advancing blade. But the CFD-CSD coupling with overflow did it, and it was really an amazing breakthrough. And the maneuver loads problem, which we did a few years later, uh, shows on the top the, the transient data over 40 revolutions of the pitch link loads, showing RCAS at the bottom with conventional aerodynamics and RCAS coupled with overflow in the middle. And as I said, that kind of led to uh, the CREATE program. All right, just to wrap up quickly. In 50 years of vertical lift R&D, we have seen tremendous advances in fundamental knowledge, experimental data, computer power, prediction accuracy, and collaboration in academic infrastructure. That's a whole story in itself. Air vehicle capability is similarly advanced, but program development efficiency, time and cost seem to be a continuing challenge. What are the greatest R&D challenges 
and most pressing priorities? Well, I'm sure you have some of your own. But I would say a few things. Effective R&D means you have to stay close to the customers and their needs. Focus on the right problem. What's that? Well, one thing, you can check history or trust the smart people with the track record. We need always accurate, reliable codes. And I can say just today, I've been kind of amazed at some of the progress we made, even the last presentation, okay? But that means accurate validation data, accurate validation from well-designed experiments. And we can always do better at that. Unmet challenges, somebody's already talked about the vibration problem. That's kind of been neglected. Well, partly because it's a very hard problem and it remains elusive. What do we need from leadership? Well, this is probably pretty, pretty basic. R&D success starts with attracting good people and then balancing support, freedom, and trust with mission accountability for folks. And then, of course, the eVTOL revolution. There is great potential and great challenges. I don't think it's about a particular configuration per se, more about the basic approaches and experience that brought to bear. Uh, James gave us some, some good ideas this morning about the development of Project Zero, and he has a lot of experience along those lines. So there are many rotorcraft lessons to learn from, and we should keep going. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you feel free to ask questions of I and my co-authors and the other folks here. Thank you. Thank you.